this video, we're going to talk about the log mean temperature difference, um, which is useful for analyzing parallel flow and counter flow heat exchangers. It's one of two specific methods that we'll be using to analyze heat exchangers. This method is useful for allowing you to select a heat exchanger that will achieve a specified temperature change in a fluid with a known mass flow rate. While our discussion will be limited to these types of heat, ex uh, heat exchangers and not cross flow or multi pass shell and tube heat exchangers, for example, be aware that heat exchangers other than parallel or ca and counter flow uh, are analyzed with this method, but a correction factor has to be used. We'll make several assumptions in our discussion. First, we'll say that our heat exchanger operates at steady state. There are negligible changes in kinetic and potential energy of the fluids from the inlet to the outlet, and there's no heat loss from the units. In other words, the unit is perfectly insulated. If we do that, we can say that the heat transfer rate between the two streams is equal to the heat transfer rate from the hot stream to the cold stream, which is equal to the heat transfer rate from the cold stream to the hot stream. If we assume the fluid is incompressible and with constant specific heats, we can put this in terms of M dot CP times the temperature difference, which has been put as T hot minus uh, T hot in minus T hot out to give us a positive quantity. This is the energy balance applied to the hot stream. I could combine the mass flow rate and the specific heat terms, which gives us a convenient quantity called the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid. The heat capacity rate represents the rate of heat transfer required to uh, change the temperature of the fluid by one degree Celsius as it flows through a heat exchanger. So the heat capacity rate, if the heat capacity rate was large, the temperature change for a given heat transfer rate would be small. We could do the same thing to the cold fluid. Note how the temperature difference has been switched around to T cold out minus T cold in to give us a positive quantity. And we could put that in terms of the capacity rate as well uh, for the cold fluid as well. So now let's look at some general concepts for parallel and counter flow heat exchangers. Let's look at the parallel flow one, uh, parallel flow one first. So in a parallel flow heat exchanger, the hot and cold streams enter at the same end. Uh, so this once again results in the highest heat transfer rate due to the highest temperature difference between the two fluids, at the inlet at least. And as the fluids flow through, the hot fluid cools off, the cold fluid heats up, and they come closer to the same temperature at the outlet. So we have things in terms of our heat capacity rates. Let's look at two limiting cases for the parallel flow heat exchanger. If the hot fluid is condensing over the cold fluid, which is the case, uh, which is the case that we have in a closed feed water heater in a Rankine cycle or a condenser, the condensing fluid is undergoing a constant pressure and thus a constant temperature phase change. So its temperature is not changing, but it is transferring heat to the cold fluid. And since the temperature is changing, the heat capacity rate must be approaching infinity to make sure that balance, that energy balance works out. Likewise, in a boiler where the cold fluid, where it's the cold fluid that's undergoing a phase change, decreasing the temperature of the hot stream while having no temperature change of its own, the heat capacity rate must approach infinity to make that energy balance work out. For a counter flow heat exchanger, the hot and cold streams enter at opposite ends. So the highest temperature of the hot stream is on the left side in the picture at its outlet, and the lowest temperature of the cold stream is on the right side at its inlet. That means that the temperature difference between the two streams is never as large as it is for a parallel flow. So in the graph, we see the arrows pointing in opposite directions to indicate the direction of flow, and you can see that the temperature gradient is comparable at every single point along the length. Um, now that doesn't mean that they're parallel, that depends on the heat capacity rates. They are only parallel, meaning that the temperature difference is constant along the length, if the heat capacity rates are equal. An important thing to note here is that with the exception uh, to a counterflow, with the exception of a counterflow heat exchanger where the heat capacity rates are identical, the temperature difference between the hot and cold fluids will vary along the length of the heat exchanger. 
So if we want a way to calculate the total amount of heat exchanged between the hot and cold fluid, we need to define a convenient temperature difference to work with. And for this, we'll use the log mean temperature difference. Notice that this incorporates a heat transfer coefficient u. Remember that we have to specify the overall heat transfer coefficient for the hot side or the cold side, but if the areas on the hot and cold side are equal, such as the case with a thin tube, we can say that U for the cold and hot side are equal and just designated as U. Uh, so in a parallel and counterflow heat exchanger, the temperature difference between the hot and cold temperature fluid will vary along the length of the heat exchanger. In a parallel flow heat exchanger, the temperature difference will decrease from the inlet to the outlet. The relationship in a counterflow heat exchanger is not as clear, uh, and the difference between the two streams will be dependent on the heat capacity rate of the two streams. So we're going to define an average temperature difference between the two streams. You'll see that this takes, a pl takes the form of the log mean temperature difference, but think of it as an average temperature difference, which will be used with the overall heat transfer coefficient to calculate the heat transfer rate. We'll derive this for a parallel flow heat exchanger, but the relationship will be valid for a counterflow heat exchanger as well. So we define the rate of thermal energy flowing through for a hot stream, which we'll say is on top, and we'll do the same thing for a cold stream below. And as we saw, we can define the heat transfer rate between the two streams in terms of the heat capacity rate. Now, as we derive the relationship, we'll limit ourselves to, the, to a differential section of the heat exchanger and put things, uh, put, put things in, in terms of um, put things in terms of the differential uh, heat transfer rate and differential changes in temperature. So we could put those differential temperature changes a little bit more compactly. And now we subtract dTH and dTC and express that a little bit more cleanly as well. I can solve for dTH and then solve for dTC. Um, and then put that a little mo bit more cleanly. Now I'm going to introduce the heat transfer rate between the two fluids uh, in terms of the overall heat transfer coefficient U. Uh, this, is, this overall heat transfer coefficient will take into consideration the resistance to convection and resistance to conduction between the two fluids. Um, and it'll have units of watts per meters squared Kelvin. I've also defined the, the differential heat transfer here as well, so I can use it in a second. The temperature difference will be the temperature difference between the two fluids at any location along the length of those two tubes. So I plug in the definition for dQ, and now I gather like terms, and I have my temperature terms on the left and everything else on the right. I realized I could put those temperature differences in terms of the delta T that I defined a few minutes ago. And now I can integrate the left-hand side from delta T at the inlet to delta T at the outlet. And I integrate the right-hand side from x equals 0 to x equals L. Uh, note how I put the differential area in terms of x. I'm making a simplification here that the wall of the inner tube is small so that the area exposed to the hot side and cold side are the same. And integrating, I get the following. Now I get an expression for 1 over CH plus CC from my energy balance before. I rearrange and put those temperature differences in terms of the delta T that I've been working with. And then I rearrange that equation and I solve for Q. I want to get rid of the negative sign. So I just distribute it and notice how the terms in that natural log have flipped. And then finally, it doesn't really matter what, it doesn't really matter what in that I designate as the inlet or the outlet just long, as long as I'm consistent. So in more general terms, we'll label one side one and the other side two. And this is our final equation for the log mean temperature difference. It'll be very, it'll come in very handy when it comes to calculating the heat transfer rate, the overall surface area, um, and the overall heat transfer coefficient if the inlet and outlet temperatures are known. 
If this is not the case, um, the log mean temperature difference involves an iterative process to determine heat transfer rates and outlet temperatures for prescribed inlet conditions. Um, and in the next video, we'll talk about the effective, effectiveness NTU method, which is more suited to that task. Well, thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions.